the solution for the things happening all around the world. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad basically means to strive to struggle. The Hindus and the Muslims will be united. He is not cosmic energy, he is more superior than that. Quran gives you the solution to the problems of humankind. Not that we shall despise each other. That according to Japan, India will be the superpower of the world. We will be a superpower, we will be far superior to the Americans. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain, amma abad, a'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim, bismillahi r-rahmani r-rahim, wa man ahasun kawla min man da'i lillahi, wa amli salihon, wa kawla inna ni al-muslimin, rabbi shahli sadri, wa yasilli amri, wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafqahu kawli. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. You're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or the propagation of Islam. So if there are any questions from the brothers and sisters, they're most welcome. Any sisters have any questions? I've been living alone in Bombay. I'm working here. I'm working for a media organization. And I've been told that it's wrong for me to live alone. And another thing would be, another, which confuses me, because uh, the Prophet also said that, you know, uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, if you have to go for education, you can go to China, you know, like, and that's for both men and women. So I'm working here, and I'm living alone, and I'm very ambitious. I want to work, and uh, I've been told that I can't. So what exactly is it that the Quran says for me? This has a question that she has come to Bombay. She lives in Bombay. She's working in Bombay and she lives alone. So people have said that living alone is prohibited. She gave the reference that the Prophet said, you can even go to China to get education. So why can't I come here? So what am I doing? Is it right or wrong? So the point number one, that the hadith you quoted, that you can even go to China for knowledge is a zaif hadith. In fact, it's a mawdu hadith. It's a fabricated hadith. Because at the time of the Prophet, China was in the center of education. But there are many other verses and hadith of the Prophet for example, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it mentioned in Bihaqi and Ibn Majah, it is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. The first guidance given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran was Ikra. So Ikra, chapter 96, verse number one, is to read, to recite. So education is important, but the hadith you quoted was Zaif and Maudu. Point number two, you said that, is it fine that you're living alone and you're working? As far as living alone for a woman, a woman should always live with a mahram when she travels outside or overnight. Since I understand you have come from outside Bombay and are living in Bombay. So when you are traveling outside and when you are living overnight, you should be with a mahram. Either with your husband if you are married or with your father or with your brother mahram or maybe a group of ladies staying together. Because Islam believes in protection of the woman. It is not that Islam restricts the freedom. People tell me that, no, Islam restricts the freedom of the woman, that she has to go with Mehram. And I only give the example that whenever the president of America, when he travels, he has many bodyguards. Bodyguards, security, why? He has a special plane, why? Not that we want to degrade the president of a country, we want to protect. Like when George Bush also came, he came in his own aeroplane, Air Force One. It is better than a bungalow and what all, it came as headlines in the newspapers. What facilities the Air Force One has? So many facilities if anything goes wrong. Why? Not that they want to restrict the freedom of the president of America, they want to take care. Similarly, in Islam, we want to take care of a woman. That is the reason we want to see that she is secured, point number one. So for a woman to go outside and stay alone, even for education is wrong. She can have other alternatives, she can stay with a relative, or she can stay with a group of women, not that she can stay alone even for education. Fine, or she stays in ladies' hostel. There are many ulmas, sheikhs who have given fatwa. And as a last resort, best is with the mehram. As a last resort, if she travels and stays in a girls' hostel and seeing the security and everything, X, Y, Z, many conditions are there, then it may be permitted, which is some of the sheikhs' object. And for working sister, point number one, a woman need not work in Islam. In Islam, a woman doesn't have to earn for her living. It is the duty of the man in the family. Before she is married, it is the duty of the father and the brother, and after she is married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. In Islam, a woman need not work, but if she wishes to work, and she wants to contribute, she can work as long as the work is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. But naturally, she can't do any work which is against the Sharia, which breaks the hijab, for example, modeling, singing, etc. And many works which is prohibited for the woman are also prohibited for the man, like working in a gambling den, 
working in an alcoholic bar, doing dishonest business. So whatever work she is doing, it should be within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. If she is working in an organization, there should be proper segregation of sexes. She can't work as a typist or a secretary of a boss, and then they are in the same room, and she's typing a letter. A prophet said, if a man and a woman, Naam and Rama, in the same room, alone, then the third person is the devil. So if all the rules of the Sharia are followed, and the hijab is not broken, and if she works in an organization, it's allowed. But if she breaks the Islamic Sharia, she doesn't have to work at Saram, point number one. Point number two, even if a worker is going to another city and staying alone in a house, renting a house, according to me, Saram, according to Islam, it's Saram. Because it's the duty of her father or brother, if she's not married, to look after lodging, boarding, clothing, and financial aspect. If she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after her. If not, then it is the duty of the Ummah. So she need not work. No one can force her to work. Even if they are poor, the husband cannot force her. Husband can request her, and if she wishes to work, as long as the work she is doing is in the point of the Islamic Sharia, then it's permitted. So for you, sister, I hope you have got the answer. Any brother have any question? Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, brother Lakir. I have spoken with few of non-Muslim friends of mine. Uh, they all are Hindu. So they have a strong uh, thing that uh, God has taken avatar on earth and they came in the form of man. I have quoted him the words from their own scriptures, Vedas and all. But they are like, yes, I have, we believe in these things, but no, God can do all these things. So how can you make them you know, more convinced of that uh, God has not taken any avatar on earth? Well, that's the question that when he speaks to the Hindu friends, they say that God has got avatar. How can he convince the Hindus about the concept of avatar that God himself has come down can we agree or how to dava with them? As far as the concept of avatar is concerned, the Sanskrit word avatar is derived from av and tra. Av means down and tra means descend, to descend down. And if you read the Oxford Dictionary, it says that avatar, according to Hindu mythology, means almighty God coming to the earth in human form. So for an average common Hindu, he believes that avatar is almighty God coming on this earth in human bodily form. This is what they believe. And this they derived from the verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 4, verse number 7 and 8, which says that whenever there is a rise of unrighteousness and decay of righteousness, I will manifest myself, O Bharata, and I will come for the protection of the good and the destruction of the evil, to establish the good. I will come down in every age. It says, Sam Bhavami Yuge Yuge. It's a very common verse which is always recited even on the television in Mahabharat. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. That whenever there is rise of unrighteousness and decay of righteousness, I will manifest myself. I will come for the protection of the good and the destruction of the evil. To establish the religion, I will come in every age. So based on this verse of Bhagavad Gita, Chapter number 4, verse number 7 and 8, which is also repeated in the Bhagavad Purana. Chapter number 24, shlok number 56. The same thing, that whenever there is decay of righteousness and rise of unrighteousness, I will manifest myself. So based on these two verses, they have propounded about Almighty God coming in this world in bodily form. But if we read the Vedas, the Vedas is the highest authority in all the Hindu scriptures. If anything contradicts the Veda, the Veda should be followed. In Veda, this concept of Almighty God coming in bodily form is nowhere to be mentioned. The word avatar is not mentioned. And many Hindu scholars say that the word avatar is derived from av and tra, descending down. It is a possession of God. So it cannot be God himself coming down, but it can refer to Almighty God sending someone else. So many Hindu scholars, they believe that Almighty God has sent other human beings. And this concept is mentioned in the Vedas. If we read with book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4 and 5, it speaks about saintly people who God has sent. Similarly, in Islam, we don't believe the Almighty God has to come down and take a bodily form. What we believe, Almighty God chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level who we call as messengers or as Rasul. So this argument, Almighty God coming in this world in bodily form, 
is nowhere mentioned in the Vedas. And if we try and reconciliate Veda with Bhagavad Gita, even the Bhagavad Gita verse, that whenever there's rise and decay of righteousness and rise of unrighteousness, Almighty God sends messengers, we have no objection. So if we have to reconciliate Veda and Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Purana, we have to agree that even that means the same. Almighty God sends messengers. If we analyze most of the major religions besides Islam. They believe in the philosophy of anthropomorphism. Almighty God coming down in humanly form. Some religions believe he came down once, some believe he came several times. And all these religions, to prove their point, what they say, that Almighty God is so holy, he's so pure, he's so pious, he doesn't know the shortcomings of the human beings. That's the reason he came down in this world to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. You know, he's so pure, he's so holy, he doesn't know how does human being feel when he's hurt, when he's troubled, when he's in pain. So he came down in humanly form to know what is good or what is bad for the human beings so that he could set the rules for the human being. On the face of it, it sounds like a very good logic. But I see and I argue that if suppose I manufacture a VCR, a video cassette recorder, or an audio cassette player. Do I have to be a VCR? Do I have to become an audio cassette player to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR or the audio cassette player? What do I do? Since I'm the inventor, I write an instruction manual that if you want to play the cassette, insert the cassette and press the play button. If you want to fast forward, press the fast forward button. If you want to rewind, press the rewind button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it in water, it will get spoiled. I write an instruction manual. I don't have to become a VCR or audio cassette player to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR or the audio cassette player. Similarly, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is the creator of the human beings, he doesn't have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. What does he do? He writes the instruction manual. And the last and final instruction manual for the human beings is the glorious Quran. And he communicates his message by choosing a man amongst men who in Islam we call as messengers. And the mention of messengers is given in Hindu scriptures. I have given a talk, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. It is more than one hour long. And I have given various references of Hindu scriptures where the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned. Hope that answers the question. Any brothers have any questions? Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Naik, there is a verse in the Quran in which it is mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask Jesus, peace be upon him, on the day of Akhira, that uh, did you ask your followers to take uh, you and your mother as two gods besides Allah? And uh, the Christians uh, say that uh, the Quran has got the wrong concept of Trinity because it is considering uh, mother of Jesus. Mary to be one person of the Trinity, which is actually the wrong concept of Trinity. We ask the question, he's referring to the verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116, that on that day Jesus Christ will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you be my witness and never told them to worship me or my mother. But I said, Oh Budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbi Kumud, my Lord and your Lord. So based on this, the Christians argue that the Quran has got the wrong concept of Trinity. In Trinity, we don't believe that Mother Mary is part of Trinity. This is the argument. Point number one, as far as Mother Mary, Mother Mary Salam is concerned, I do agree that today, the majority of the Christians, they don't consider Mother Mary to be part of the Trinity. But there are many Christians, for example, the Catholics. The Catholics are more in number than the Protestants. They give a special status to Mother Mary, which the Protestants don't give. That is the reason in a Catholic church, you'll even find the statue of Mother Mary, which you'll not find in the Protestant church. So even today, the majority of the Christians, they believe and they give a special status to Mother Mary, which is not given by the other Christians. So the thing is they, that even today, there are Christians, though directly they worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, but the moment they make a statue of Mother Mary and keep her in the church, indirectly they're worshiping even Mother Mary. And there are special days, like for example, Mount Mary, Mount Mary Fair they have. You know Mount Mary Fair, where hundreds of thousands of people gather for what? What do they do? They are worshipping Mother Mary indirectly. So even today the Catholics, they make a statue and they put a candle in front for what? If not directly, at least indirectly, yes. So the verse of the Quran only says that do not worship me or my mother. So even today most of the Catholics, directly or indirectly, they do even worship 
Mother Mary. But what they consider? They consider Jesus Christ please be upon him to be God or the Son of God. So the moment they say Son of God, begotten Son of God, and Mother Mary is the mother, so you can judge for yourself what is the status of Mother Mary. If they consider Jesus Christ please be upon him to be Son of God, so Mother Mary becomes who? We don't have to spell it out. Fine. She becomes the mother of God. Mother of God or the mother or son of God. So how you want to say, you can say it, but it is very illogical to speak like that. But that's what they assume. So that's the reason in my talks I've said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no verse in the Bible in which Jesus Christ himself has said that I am God of Isa, worship me. All these are deductions of the Christians Nowhere did Jesus Christ peace be proclaimed divinity. He was a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that's the question. Any sisters have any questions? Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. According to a hadith, uh, those who draw pictures will be in hellfire. So what about the teachers or as a mother when we have to draw pictures to teach the children? Sister asked a very good question. There is a say hadith which says that anyone who is a musawwir, who draws a picture or a portrait, it will be asked on the day of judgment that put life in them. And all these are destined for hellfire, it's a Sai Hadith. But there are always exceptions to the rules. There are other Sai Hadith in which we find Hadith in Sai Bukhari, in Sai Hadith of Abu Dawood, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. The Prophet permitted her even to play with a toy or there was a horse which had wings. So for children, there is an exception to the rule that for the children, if they play with toys, etc., which may resemble idols, it's permitted. And even for the mother of the children, it's clearly mentioned hadith. Furthermore, if we extend, it even includes the teachers of the children. So if a teacher does a drawing or makes a sculpture of clay modeling, whatever it is, for the purpose of education only, it's allowed. But if a teacher does painting and sells in the market for any money, that's totally haram. So if a mother or a teacher to educate the child does some portrait, does some painting, etc., for the children, as long as they're young, it's permitted in Islam, but not for selling in the market, then that hadith will be liable, that Allah will ask you to put life in that picture and your destination will be hellfire. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, brother. Asalaamu Alaikum. With regards to painting, uh, does it also include abstract painting, which there are normal modern art painters that do, or it has to do only with things that have life? That's the question. As far as painting is concerned, does it involve abstract painting or only painting with life? But naturally, in context, I thought that the questioner knew what the question was, that painting and making portraits of living creature, it is known as janwar. Living creature, we don't include plant kingdom mean living creature which can think. So that includes human beings and animals. We not all living creatures. The plants are also living. So plants you can do. Tree you can paint. It is mainly those that can think. In Arabic it is one who has knowledge. One who can think and who can rationalize. There is a rational creature and an irrational creature. So in the rational creature, in the Arabic language, it includes the human beings and the animals. So you can't do portraits of human being and animal. Otherwise, painting of landscape is fine. Painting of a building is fine, abstract painting. If it doesn't involve any living creature, including mainly the animals and the human beings, plants and all is fine, is permitted. So if it comes under these restricted things, then it's haram, otherwise it's fine. So these haram things for children is permitted. Hope that answers the question. Any other brothers have any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. What are the life insurance policies and uh, other policies are permissible to Islam? We ask the question that is life insurance or other policies, medi-claim, etc., are they allowed in Islam and what is the ruling? As far as life insurance or medi-claim, etc., per se life insurance is not haram, it's permitted. Because the beloved Prophet said, trust in God but tie a camel. But since today, most of the life insurance policies, they involve riba, they involve interest, therefore it becomes haram. But if the life insurance policy is based on Islamic guidelines, there are many life insurance policies in Pakistan, in Oman, in Dubai, which are based on Islamic Sharia, the money that you give. In a normal general life insurance, when the premium you give, they take your money and they keep it on interest. And if something goes wrong, 
they look after you from the interest money which is haram. In the Islamic system, they take your money and they invest it in an Islamic business based on Islamic Sharia. So if anything goes wrong, you get sick, whatever the money they give you, it is from this halal income. So life insurance per se is not haram, medical claim per se is not haram, but if it deals with riba, which most of them deal with riba, it's haram. If it deals with Islamic system based on Sharia, it's perfectly allowed. Hope that's the question. Any brother have any questions? I'm uh, Dr. Zubair from Maru Landiri. Uh, Rasulullah said, uh, those who have not gone in jihad, then how you will enter in Jannat? I have heard your tape on jihad in, to in toto, but then from Quran, Hadith, you know, you have to, you know, it's not enough to just pray five times, so roza, namaz, family, practice, earning business, but you have to move out, spend some time, you know. So, uh, I didn't know how to answer. I asked a question, he being a doctor, one of his friends said, that only keeping roza, reading salah, praying five times, is not suffering, you have to do jihad. Go out and move and jihad. Do jihad. You have to move out and do jihad. So is it right? He's totally right. The jihad should be there. But what is the meaning of jihad? Is important. Jihad, many people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason is called as jihad. Whether it be for his personal gain, whether it be for money, whether it be for fame, it's called as jihad. Jihad doesn't mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether personal gain or fame. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive. In Islamic context, it means to strive against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and fight against oppression. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. So every Muslim should do jihad. There's no doubt about it. But I'm understanding what he's trying to say. Jihad means and go. You have to go and fight, pick up a gun, or pick up a sword, or pick up a knife. See, jihad becomes a fard on any Muslim if the call is given by the Khalifa. Jihad becomes fard on a Muslim if the head of state says jihad. Irrespective whether you're a doctor, or an engineer, or a lawyer. We can say, oh, I'm a doctor. He may say, okay, go and treat the patients in the battlefield. Or he may say, it's not required. Don't treat, pick up a sword, so you have to pay. That is if the Khalifa, the head of state, gives a call. Otherwise, it's not a fard. Just because your friend says, I say, it doesn't become fard. Now what has happened, that now I feel the best type of jihad. That war is one type of jihad. The best jihad today is to strive and struggle to remove the misconception of Islam. According to me, the best jihad today is dawah. Imagine, like we know what happened in Denmark, speaking against the Prophet, what are you going to do? Take a sword. You have to fight them in the media. And the six levels are described. Do that. That is jihad. Fight in the media, may take out a peaceful protest, maybe economic embargo, ban their products, maybe a legal suit, political action. Last is maybe by the burning of flags, etc. All this I discussed. And the best type of jihad, if you have heard my answer, keeps on changing depending upon the situation. It's not one and the same. But generally, to fight against your own evil inclination is the best jihad. Hope that's the question. Waqhru dawana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Ya Rabbu innaka anta salam Minka salamu ilayka salam Ya Rabbu innaka anta salam Minka salamu ilayka salam Li amrika yarjiu amru alam بين يديك قلوب الأنام لأمرك يرجع أمر الأنام بين يديك قلوب الأنام